We have a, an excellent speaker today for you on a topic that will be quite interesting. And it's not every day that we have somebody that is, uh, let's see, a fellow of the AMS, a fellow of the ABU, a fellow of the, of the AAAS, and a member of the National Academy to come speak to us. And so today we have George Philander with us from Princeton. Um, George, uh, a little bit older than me, uh, not too much. <laughs> But he, um, he's from South Africa, where he got his, did his undergraduate work, and then went to Harvard for his PhD, MIT for postdoc, and then on to GFEL at, at Princeton, where he was a, a scientist there at NOAA for many years before becoming a professor at Princeton University, followed by being department chairman. And uh, most recently, he did a stint in South Africa, developing programmatic studies there, and today he's going to talk about some concepts uh, that pertain to climate on this earth of ours. And tomorrow, uh, he's going to give a, a noontime brown bag luncheon on the work he's been doing in South Africa and, and some other concepts about uh, minority students and women in, in higher education. So um, I'm not going to take up any more of George's time because he's worth He's listening to a lot more than I am. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I should uh, alert you that uh, on my computer I have something like 30 different versions of a paper I try to write about what I'm going to talk about. And I've had a lot of trouble communicating what my ideas, especially to paleontologists. And I'm told this may go on YouTube, so I have to be careful what I say. But the, I would say it was, it's been like trying to mix uh, oil and vinegar. <laughs> it's different communities, different vocabularies, different cultures. It, it, it's proved very difficult. So any comments you have, I sort of appreciate. Now, I've become very intrigued. Why is it so difficult for people from different specialties to communicate with each other and more and a quick digression but I read a book recently by a fellow called Kahneman he's an, a psychologist who won a Nobel Prize in economics for showing there's no such thing as a rational man uh, economists assume that we act rationally in the economic world and he proceeded to demonstrate that's not true and I've become convinced that scientists too that we sort of handicapped by our background and it's actually very difficult to communicate with other groups. So it's, it's not just uh, people engaging in economics. Uh, I, I sort of recommend Kahneman's book. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. We, we can discuss at the end of the talk if you're interested. Uh, I think I have found a way to try and bridge the two groups. So I'll, I'll start. Everybody knows about El Nino, and it, it's the only thing I know a little bit about. And so I'm convinced it's important for everything on the planet. And so let me introduce you to this family, the, the family tree. And in any family, the most important members are the youngest ones. So we're off to a good start because everybody knows the youngest members of this family. Uh, it, it's La Nina literally means the girl. El Nino is the boy. And you, you could see that the boy is rather featureless of chubby, uh, plump. The, the girl is far more interesting, and she has a flair for asymmetries. And the two intriguing asymmetries, the one is east-west, the uh, east is colder than the west, and the other one is north-south, and, and we'll come back to that. And I suppose it's symptomatic of our culture. The uninteresting one gets more attention <laughs> than the interesting one. Uh, so if you ask... And, and this family resemblance, so this family comes in pairs. And uh, what you're seeing here are sort of family features that are common to all of them. So if we go to the next picture, do I do that? Mm -hmm. and if you wish, I'll do it. Oh, okay. Okay, so th there's the family tree. And it has three branches. So this is the spontaneous side of the family. Uh, spontaneous in the sense that uh, 
If you ask why is there weather, there's no real answer. It's a natural mode of oscillation of the atmosphere. If you ask why is uh, El Nino occur, uh, oceanographers will tell you it's because of a change in the winds, and meteorologists will tell you the winds change because of the oceanography. And in reality, put the ocean and atmosphere together, and spontaneously they will produce El Nino. So these people appropriately have Latin names, and they, they, they're sort of the passionate branch of the family. As opposed to this side, this is the more Protestant side. They uh, like to f follow orders. And so all of these are related to some kind of forcing. Uh, you, you get these things in response to changes in sunlight. Whereas on that side, as I said, they're spontaneous. If the sunlight were perfectly steady, uh, we could still have weather. We'd still have El Nino. Uh, some of them ventured off to the far east and got involved with Japanese. But anyway, on, on that side, that's the passionate side of the family. This is the more controlled side. The, the Middle East was the slightly unstable side of the family. And they, uh, so bipolar, they have trends. They go off in some direction. And then the, the trend usually ends in the threshold. Things crash and then they reverse. So these trends reverse the thresholds and we'll come back and uh, if you get to know this family, you uh, have to learn some Spanish. So, El Nino is the boy and the girl. Uh, there's a brother, he lives in the Atlantic. There's the mother, the father. That's, my wife calls me viejo, so if you're old, you get that title. And if you, I suppose the ladies wouldn't like to be called la vieja. Anyway, uh, we'll come back to these. So the next question is, why should you be interested in this family? And I will argue that you, you must know lots of family that's slightly crazy. And uh, why is this one merit your attention? And I'll argue that El Nino can help us with some serious problems. And perhaps one of the most serious problems in the next picture has to do with uh, global warming. Um, and this is so everybody knows about global warming and the governments of the world uh, asked a bunch of distinguished scientists, a few thousands of them, uh, called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they put out reports periodically. They just put out the report a few months ago. And so this is from Nature. So it's a very prestigious scientific journal. And it tells us, how some IPCC has assisted us in identifying a serious problem. And so a huge number of reports. You can actually go back to 1982. The first report on global warming was all of 15 pages. And today it's grown into, it would take you quite a while to read all the pages. It's become very voluminous. Uh, they've used huge amounts of computer time. So the initial models if you focus on Italy over here, it was this size. And today you can actually see Italy in these models. So the resolution of the models have gone up enormously. And then here's the disturbing but uneven progress. And the uneven progress is we ask these people what will happen if CO2 doubles. And they give us estimates. But the estimates, the range, has stayed the same for several decades. It was a bit, bit embarrassing, given the number of people, increase the number of people, increase the number of resources, uh, the amount of resources, you think we could do better. <coughs> but there's been no change. If you ask them how much will global average temperatures change if CO2 doubles, uh, it was 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C way back in the 1980s. It still is. Uh, the other problem is uh, over here, they say they're now 90% certain or 99% certain it's due to human cause. So we agree, definite progress, we agree CO2 is increasing. I mean, uh, way back in the early 1900s that was contested. We agree it is caused by humans, no doubt about that. We agree that there is an increase in temperature. But we disagree as to the cause, this uncertainty. And so over here it says that they're certain that 50% of the increase in temperature 
is due to human activities. What about the other 50%? And where do they get this number? And I would argue they get the number from models, but then the models themselves have large uncertainties. So I don't want to get you wrong. This thing has become very polarized. I'm concerned about global warming, but my, it's not a popular position. But my viewers, the metaphor I'd invoke is we're in a ship in treacherous waters in the foggy conditions. We're playing with fire. Uh, we don't understand it. It's a very complicated system. We're doing something radical to it. And we should, if you're in the ship in foggy water, uh, go slow. You don't go faster. So I feel we should act not because we know what's going to happen. And part of my problems, I'm not a pessimist. I'm not in favor of gloom and doom. Uh, we should act because we actually don't know what's going to happen. Uh, however, uh, we should be able to, what, what can we do to improve the state of affairs? And I'm going to argue today uh, that we should probably pay attention to the El Nino family. So if you ask these people, what is the problem? Why can't you reduce the uncertainty? You can reduce, the whole debate, scientific debate about global warming can be summarized in one word. It's clouds. We don't know what to do about clouds. And so if I, I would claim in that case we should turn to the paleo, paleontologists because they can provide advice. So if we go to the next picture, this is some of the amazing evidence they have. So everybody knows about, every schoolboy is an expert on dinosaurs. And what people don't know is the amazing story of what our planet went through subsequently. So at this time, it's thought polar temperatures were around 15 degrees C. There were crocodiles near the North Pole. There was no ice on the planet. And then, because of plate tectonics, uh, changes in weathering and so on, CO2 reduced, Earth got colder. And then it went through these amazing ice age oscillations. And we end up here. And so what's astonishing is everything we've accomplished, uh, human civilization, uh, building cities, agriculture, anything, we did during this period. So, so we arrive on the scene very recently, and we didn't amount to much. We had some opportunities there and there, but we, only in the last five, 10,000 years, so we're at the most unusual moment in the history of the planet. And then what we're doing, so this is from the seafloor cores, this is from <coughs> Antarctic ice cores. That's what we did, the red spike. So, so that, I would say if I had to persuade people to be concerned about global warming, I, I would show them this picture rather than detailed reports. Uh, if this were the vital signs of a patient in a hospital. He comes in with a high fever and they get it under control and then he goes into convulsions and then that shoots up. You'd be really concerned. You'd rush him off to the emergency room. So I would claim there's ample cause for concern about what we're doing. And it's disquieting, if not embarrassing, that we don't have an explanation for this. Why were there ice ages? And in particular, what we'd like to know, we can go to the last glacial maximum. And so over here, the northern hemisphere had huge glaciers, and they were, sea level fell under 60 meters. All sorts of huge, huge changes. And what's intriguing is that the CO2 was much lower. And we have it. So you'd think this would be of enormous value to people developing models. Here they have a case study much lower CO2, how much did that contribute to the global cooling at that time? Right? So we'll be interested in the opposite sense. We want to know, given higher CO2, how much warming should we expect? And we can't give a definitive answer. So maybe if we can answer this reverse one, if there's much lower CO2, maybe then we can make progress in the other part. And the problem is... Again, clouds. So, so people write papers, they run their models for the last glacial maximum, and they will tell you, oh, it was colder, 
50% was lower CO2 and 50% was bigger glaciers, higher albedo. And again, snags with the, with the models and, and particular clouds. How do you know the cloudiness was not higher? Right? Under cold conditions, you expect more clouds. So today, the albedo of the planet is highest, cloudiness is highest in high latitudes. I mean, if you step outside, not in these. And St. Petersburg, where I live, if you step outside in winter and you exhale, there's a little cloud in front of you. And so moisture condenses very quickly at low temperatures. So you'd think the cloudiness contributed a lot to the cold conditions in the last glacial maximum. And uh, the models, as I said, have trouble with clouds. So we don't actually know why it was so cold at the last glacial maximum. The, what's, what have I have in the next one? Okay, so the problem we face, we want to know what's the effect of clouds in a world with either higher or lower CO2. We, we don't know. And part of the problem, is you run your model, and if we had excellent data for the last glacial maximum, we can now tune our model to get the right conditions. And then that's standard practice. Models have lots of things to tune. So why don't we use the last glacial maximum, simulate it, we get the wrong answer, and we tune it until we get the right answer, and then we have confidence. The problem is the data have lots of uncertainties. And the uncertainties are such that at the moment there are debates in journals such as science and nature as to whether the last glacial maximum in the tropical Pacific did conditions correspond to El Nino or La Nina. It's just quite astonishing. These are opposite states of affairs, El Nino, La Nina. But the data apparently does not enable us to tell which one prevailed 20,000 years ago. So the models can't be tuned because we don't know what to tune them to. And in all of science, you have the same problem, I suppose. You have some data, you make an hypothesis, which is over there. So you need the data to test if the hypothesis is right, but to interpret the hypothesis, to interpret the data, you need the hypothesis. How do we get out of this chicken and egg argument? Uh, As I said, it's common to all of science, and we've developed ways of escaping from this chicken egg argument. You, You have an hypothesis that's uncertain, but you use it to interpret data. But the data itself has flaws, and so you can't check if your hypothesis is actually right or wrong. So one approach is I'll call reductionist. And if your problem is relatively simple, if it's a matter of the planet going around the sun, you introduce an hypothesis which Newton did, and you say there's a peculiar force, gravity acts at the distance. Nobody at the time believed there's such a force. But uh, Newton then wrote down the equation and produced the result that agreed to the you know, fifth decimal place. And Newton's results were so incredibly accurate that people accept that there must be this peculiar force that acts. So one way is a reductionist method. You simplify everything. You say there's a law that governs motion of planets around the sun, and you proceed to explore the consequences of that law. The other extreme is holistic. If I ask you why do continents drift, you could start by saying, the, look at the shape, Africa and South America. Nobody's overly persuaded by that. Uh, so you say, uh, look at the rocks in Brazil and Africa. Look at the fossils in the rocks. And the evidence just keeps on accumulating. You look at the seafloor, you look at the magnetic field, you look at the age. In the end, it's the sum of a huge number of things that persuades you that continents drift. Any one thing is not particularly convincing. Right? Uh, so today, if we say the continent is all circular, that would not change your mind about a continental drift. Okay, so you, you have an approach where agreement between theory and observation to the fourth decimal place is not the issue. And this is one approach. Let's say evolutionists work similarly. Why do you believe it? It is because of a huge number of things, uh, which is quite different from this approach. So there are a few problems where you can marry the two. 
And weather prediction is an excellent example. So up to World War II, uh, weather prediction was uh, holistic. Right? Uh, you make very complicated maps, and you look for highs and lows, and you have some rules of thumb, and the high goes this way. So. And it was a fine method. It was very important World War II. But then in the early 50s, people started using computers. And it was a completely different approach. So now you have equations, and you can solve them. And in principle, you can solve them very accurately. Now, the, however, weather is so complicated, you have to make approximations. So the end result is that, for example, people in this approach would ask questions people here never asked. Uh, for example, here they never ask, why is there weather? or can it be predicted indefinitely into the future? So th these people will actually, so you had baroclinic instability, and they would ask, you know, um, why do we have weather? Can it be predicted indefinitely? And then Lorentz started the chaos theory and so on. So interesting things come out of being reductionist and considering a very idealistic world. So today... This is such a successful marriage. They've, th these models, as in the case of climate models, get tuned. Uh, models, uh, people don't seem to realize, a model can give you any result you want. Uh, and that's not a cynical statement. Uh, you can, especially the big ones, if the phenomenon is very complicated, you have lots of freedom to choose constants and so on. So in the case of weather prediction, they get a test every day, and they've used these results to get the models very accurate. And this past winter, maybe not here in St. Petersburg, in the northeast it's been incredibly impressive how accurate the weather forecasts have been. We, we've had a terrible winter, but they predicted days in advance where it would start snowing, how much snow. Uh, Katrina was another example of the recent hurricane through New York. It was, it's amazingly accurate. The models in weather forecasting are so accurate They've been tuned using data, but if one of the data stations is inaccurate and is biased, they can actually tell where the measurements are wrong. <laughs> it's a perfect marriage. It's not just a one-way thing where the measurements have been used to get better models. The models can actually tell you which instruments are erring or wrong. So what I want to propose is that this approach, a similar marriage, can work for climate, for paleo.